Episode 85 The runners run during the day again. Red adventurous dry leaves blow after them, performing a light rustling sound. Greetings and welcome in to the Patuxent General. I am your host, Jess. Fall is just beginning, and before I descend into a glorious month of apples, butternut, and pumpkins, let's take a second to explore fresh ginger and dolmatas, a delectable hors d'oeuvre I got to try at the local Greek festival. Then we chat about the Florida Lee House in Providence and all the spooks thereof. But first, I must thank our Patreon subscribers. You fresh fruit gathering folk bring the blueberries, sweet melon, peaches, raspberries, and early apples that make up the mixed fruit pies and jam that is the Patuxent General, without whom we would be two empty jars and a pie pan. So thank you. And if you would like exclusive content like these folks, simply follow the link in the show notes to join us. Otherwise, you could look up our page on Patreon.com. But until then, I've got a drink to talk about that is inspired by fresh local roots. Enjoy. This week at the Patuxent Village Farmer's Market, it may have been damp and windy, but we were lucky enough to have a front row seat to the dramatic harvest. Next to the general, Leah's vegetables had some succulent melon. They just melt in your mouth. Not to mention the fresh garlic, so sweet, so crisp. I just sliced them thinly and sautéed them gently for my vegetables, which were fabulous. But that's not what flipped my lid. This week, their ginger came in. Gorgeous pink-rimmed roots with tall three-foot-long fragrant stems and long thin leaves that want to be cooked either with chicken, mushroom, or fish, which I can't wait to try, but that's not why I'm here. This pink-edged root that the Japanese make into gari, or pickled ginger that you get aside your sushi, is, and although I like it that way, today we are making a ginger switchel. I found a simply satisfying recipe on NPR. The article is called Tickled Pink, Fresh Young Ginger is a Sweet Break from Gnarled Roots by Laura McCandish, and this is what she had to say. Vinegary drinks, kombucha, shrubs are all the rage now. I first learned about Switchel, the old-timey thirst quencher of which Laura Ingalls Wilder writes, from a recipe printed in the Times, a monthly newspaper published by the food co-op I belong to in Corvallis, Oregon. Then I first tasted this bracing American heritage beverage, sweetened only with Vermont maple syrup, at a food book fair reception. The brew mixes well with whiskey and rum, or into a switchel stout and stormy. It soothes an upset stomach or sore throat, and is long known to farmers as haymaker's punch. This recipe is adapted from the Sagadahawk M-O-F-G-A, Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association chapter, which sells this nostalgic drink at the annual Common Ground Country Fair. This makes about one average pitcher's worth. For this recipe, you will need one to one and a half quarts cold water, one third cup apple cider vinegar, one half cup maple syrup, one quarter cup blackstrap molasses, or if too strong for your taste, use a more mild honey. Two tablespoons ginger honey syrup, reserved from crystallized ginger. One tablespoon grated young ginger. One half teaspoon dried ground ginger. One lemon freshly juiced, plus extra slices reserved for garnish. Pour all the ingredients into a pitcher or jug and then stir or shake well until blended. Adjust the water, acids, ginger, or sweeteners to taste. Serve over ice with lemon slices or crystallized ginger as an optional garnish. And splash on a little sparkling water if desired. I know you'll enjoy.
Last week, I was lucky enough to attend the Cranston Greek Festival with my sister. We went to the Annunciation Church, Cranston, Rhode Island, in the pouring rain, and by that I mean drenching. It had been raining on and off for some days, and all of us were lightly flooded. We parked the car on a hill a bit away and made our way to the tents, stage, and well-watered good time. They were not kidding when they said rain couldn't stop them. It didn't. The dancers danced joyfully, the kitchen cooked merrily, and deliciously, I might add. The vendors sold skillfully, and the babies danced with unabashed glee. We soaked all this in while sipping the most sublime ouzo I have ever tried and it did not take long until we were ready for what they were grilling all around us. We looked at our options and decided to rumorate on it while we perused the church's shop. And chatting with the folks there, we learned that a portion of their proceeds from their cookbook, The Joy of Greek Cooking, goes back to preserve antiquities in Greece. I asked them how much it was and can I use the recipes in the podcast. They said a cheap fee and yes! So I decided to share one of the recipes of the fabulous items that I tried that day. Dolmadas, or stuffed grape leaves. For this recipe, you will need one one pint jar grapevine leaves, one and a half pounds ground beef, or one pound ground beef and a half pound ground pork, two and a half teaspoons salt, pepper to taste, two tablespoons vegetable oil, two onions grated, one cup long grain rice, juice of one and a half lemons, a half a cup chopped parsley, a half a cup dill, one quarter cup mint, and one quarter cup butter, two cups beef or chicken broth, and four to eight tablespoons of lemon juice. Rinse leaves in cold water. Let stand in warm water as dalmatis are being prepared. If necessary, simmer the leaves in water for 10 minutes to soften. Combine the ground meat with the next nine ingredients, adding three quarters of a cup water to make a soft, loose mixture. Place one teaspoon of the filling in the center of a grapevine leaf, ribbed side, and shape into a narrow roll. May be frozen at this point. Line a deep saucepan with grapevine leaves and arrange dolmatis in layers. Add butter, broth, and lemon juice, and cover with an inverted plate. Simmer covered for about 45 minutes or until the rice is tender. May be served with egg lemon sauce. Makes about 65 rolls. For the oven, place in a deep baking pan, barely cover with broth and butter, and bake covered at 350 degrees for 30 minutes or until the rice is tender. Now for the pressure cooker, Add butter and one cup of water. Cook 12 minutes under 15 pounds of pressure. These are best for a party, but I think that they won't stick around your house any old day. Enjoy. I want to tell you about my friend Mike and his Electromagnetic Pinball Museum and Restoration Arcade. It's an all-inclusive place to relax and share anything related to modern pinball, EM pinball, and arcade games. A group of pinball and arcade fans with an addiction to games of all kinds and Lego too. $10 gets you free play on pinball and arcade games all day. You can find them at 881 Main Street, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, or online at www.electromagneticpinballmuseum.com. In the early 90s, I had an acquaintance who was running for local office. He asked me to open a fundraiser with some a cappella singing. After I did, I was free to wander the Providence Art Club alone. All dressed up in vintage clothing and humming jazz tunes from the past, I made my way around. And I will admit to giving myself a chill walking down the stairs. But I had no idea at the time how creepy it actually was. First, let's talk about the building. Just some basic facts. Thank you, Wikipedia. The Florida Lee Studios, or Sidney Burleigh Studio, is a historic art studio and an important structure in the development of the arts and crafts movement in the United States. 
It is located at 7 Thomas Street in the College Hill neighborhood of Providence, Rhode Island. It was designed by Sidney Burley and Edmund R. Wilson and built in 1885. It was added to the National Register of Historic Places and designated a National Historic Landmark in 1992. In addition, it is part of the College Hill Historic District. The studio is a two-and-a-half-story wood frame building set on the densely built north side of Thomas Street, opposite the First Baptist Meeting House, also a National Historical Landmark. Its main facade is half-timbered, with elaborately stuccoed sections filling the spaces between the timbers. On the first level, there are two bays that on the right with a grouping of six casement windows in two tiers of three, of different sizes at each tier. The left bay has a recessed entryway, topped by a row of stucco panels and windows above. The second level projects slightly and has a paired casement windows that project in a manner resembling a folding screen. On either side and in between of these two sections are colored panels bearing allegorical representations of sculpture, painting, and architecture. The triangular gable area above this area is shingled and recessed square window just below the gable point. The interior is relatively simple with an enclosed stair rising on the left side of the building to the mezzanine level, a full second floor, and an attic area. The first floor is divided, with a classroom and reception area in the south and a studio space on the north side. The staircase on the northwest corner leads from the studio to the mezzanine. The mezzanine is open with a small studio space over the entrance. Smaller studio spaces occupy the second floor and attic level. The building drew immediate notice in architectural publications in recognition for its unification of useful and ornamental arts. George William Whitaker, known as the Dean of Providence Painters, shared space with Burley in the studio during the late 1800s. In 1939, the structure was deeded to the Providence Art Club by Burleigh's widow. In accordance with the stipulation of her gift, the space is still used for artist studios. Horror writer H.P. Lovecraft made the Florida Lee building the residence of his character Henry Anthony Wilcox, a young artist and sculptor in his famous tale, The Call of Cthulhu. And in that tale, he says this about the building. Wilcox still lived alone in the Florida Lees building in Thomas Street, a hideous Victorian imitation, 17th century Brighton architecture, which flaunts its stuccoed front amidst the lovely colonial houses on the ancient hill and under the very shadow of the finest Gregorian steeple in America. I found him at work in his rooms, and at once conceded from the specimens scattered about that his genius is indeed profound and authentic. He will, I believe, sometime be heard from as one of the great decadents, for he is crystallized in clay, and will one day mirror in marble these nightmares and fantasies which Arthur McKen evokes in prose and Clark Ashton Smith makes visible in verse and in painting. But that's not all. There is old-timey tea to spill and possibly a ghost. Was that what I was feeling when I was coming down the stairs all those years ago? You see, Sidney Burley carried on an affair while living his extravagant artist life at Flirtily House. One in particular ended in tragedy. When a gifted painter Angela O'Leary gassed herself to death in December 1921. And according to Haunted Providence, her ghost wanders the halls of the building. Visit the Providence Art Club for yourself and let me know what you think. Is this place haunted by a vexed artist? I'm not sure, but maybe we'll find out next time at the Patuxent General. Thank you for joining us again today here at the PG. If you'd like to reach out to us with a question, comment, 
local ghost story, or maybe an order for the Pop-Up General Store. Our email is jess at patuxetgeneral.com. Please reach out. We can't wait to hear from you. But until then, I'll meet you right back here next time at the Patuxet General. A Something for Posterity production, pre-recorded in Patuxent.